Hi everyone, so it's time to start the third round of the panel of talks. So the third round uh, will be focusing on issues about agent-based modeling, simulation, and using online networks to verify or test new theories or uh, hypotheses. So you will hear a lot of talks about using uh, specific experiments and experimenting with real people uh, for doing computational social science. And the first talk, uh, first speaker is uh, Dr. Damon Santola coming from University of Pennsylvania. Hi, better late than never, okay. Um, so in thinking about the lessons from a, a decade of computational social science, I sort of broke it into three large categories, thinking first about methods and the advances and also some of the lessons we've learned about what works and doesn't work. Um, and then importantly, some of the ways we can use this to develop theory. Um, and some of the new theoretical ideas that can be tested and really developed in this space. And then finally, uh, what this means for connecting basic research to policy, which is a, a kind of a connection that's been difficult to make historically, but I think that this sort of space gives us a new opportunity to think that through. So methodologically, I think that um, one of the big ideas here is that we can start to think of uh, studying populations not as a series of individuals studied one at a time and then aggregated subsequently to describe a population, but as a collective body, and we can think of the population itself as an actor, right? And by thinking about things this way, we can study sort of the collective movements and also the sort of complex behaviors that can emerge that would have been impossible to study if we couldn't do this. Um, so one of the early examples of this was done by um, one of my colleagues in grad school, Matt Soganek, with Peter Dodds and Duncan Watts, and he studied the downloading behavior. And what they did is they created um, an online uh, music downloading site um, and they created kind of self-contained communities where each, each community had like thousands of people in it. And what they were able to show was that by structuring kind of the information they gave to people, they could create, create kind of a cascade of behavior and generate kind of a collective um, phenomena where, you know, certain songs became popular, but in different communities you saw different phenomena. And so by virtue of structuring kind of the information people had or kind of the, the interface experience, you could really generate different kinds of collective behaviors in each of these populations. Now, one of the take-home lessons for this, of course, is the, you know, the importance of social influence for understanding these kinds of dynamics, but also there's a really important take-home which was inadvertent, which was that they also found, which they didn't expect to find, was that screen position really mattered. So actually more important for understanding these results than the number of downloads by other people was the actual position of the song on the screen. Right, so even if you deleted all the social information, just having something at the top made it more likely to be downloaded. And then the more recent study, uh, Sinan Aral did a similar thing with upvoting and downvoting and showed that upvotes were more likely to be propagated, whereas downvotes weren't. But again, it's a screen position effect. So upvotes tend to show up on the front page, right, because they're upvoted. Downvotes disappear because they, they disappear from the front page. And so we tend to sort of attribute these kinds of things to social dynamics, where in effect, when we move into this online space, the actual graphical interface matters a lot and can affect our results in the way that we're able to really study these kinds of phenomena. So my way of sort of moving uh, from the kind of user experience into thinking about social structure has been to look at the pattern of connectedness in a social network among people in an online community. So my first study in this space put people into an online health community and then segmented people with you know, hundreds of people in each community and structured those by kind of connecting them in different ways in the social networks. And so what you got is one community that looked a certain way and one community that looked a different way. And then we could study the diffusion of a new health technology through those populations and study how it affected both the speed of the diffusion process and the ultimate success of diffusion through these populations. So this is a new way of thinking about theory more generally um, and thinking about computational social science as cumulative social science. Right? and thinking about the sort of capacity to develop formal models of collective behavior, and then develop from those clear theoretical predictions which then lead to experimental tests, and most importantly, that last loop, where it becomes kind of a cumulative dialectic, where then we can take the lessons from our experimental results and use them to inform our thinking about how we want to mo model collective behavior, because right now, our models are relatively unconstrained. We kind of rely on intuitions, and here we should be able to constrain them with the data we figured out. So one example of this um, is a study that uh, was published uh, last year um, in PNAS, and this was a study of the emergence of social norms, and it was based on a mathematical model. So the model was, if you let people talk to each other and try to figure out a new social norm, it could be anything. And the idea here was that if people coordinate, they kind of coordinate on a color. These are agents, by the way, in an agent-based model. Um, and in one, you know, one world, they're in a kind of a lattice network, and in one world, they're on a fully connected network. 
Um, and if you watch these sort of interactions evolve, you get kind of local coordination um, in these sort of lattice neighborhoods, but globally it fails to coordinate. Whereas in the fully connected network, you get rapid global coordination. Now the question is, can we use those sort of agent models to describe real human social norms and how they emerge? So this was an experiment. So these are real, real human beings put into a, a naming game environment where they have to coordinate with other people to name objects, where they can type in anything. And when people coordinate, it shows up the same color. And you start to see in these uh, real human populations the same emergent social dynamics that you saw in the agent-based model, where you see sort of spatial clusters emerge um, in the lattice network and uh, a, a sort of a failure to coordinate glo uh, globally. Whereas in the homogenous mixing case, you actually see it, you know, among strangers interacting online, the rapid emergence of global coordination in the population. And this gives us a way of then thinking about what this means for real human behaviors emerging um, in contexts that we care about. So one application I started to think about is what this means for politics and political ideologies and kind of the spread of, of political memes. Um, so how would you evaluate this institution? We ran this and we saw that people, you know, kind of coordinated on a, an honorable, but if we seeded just a little bit um, an opinion into the population, we can get them all to coordinate on corrupt, right? So how influenceable are populations? And what does this mean for are the ways in which we can use online networks to really change the dynamics of coordination? So when we think about this for policy, some of the applications we've worked on, um, uh, one Jing Wen's project on pen shape and the way we can structure networks to influence exercise behavior, but also um, another project, actually all three of these Jing Wen is working on, um, uh, with IUDs and looking at how we can use these networks to influence uh, birth control decisions and also um, cerebral cancer prevention and HPV vaccination. Um, so in summary, we can think about sort of creating social worlds online and then testing uh, really large-scale theories of collective behavior in these spaces, and then thinking about what that means for policy interventions. All of this will be discussed at length in the forthcoming book, How Behavior Spread. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jin Wen Zhang, and um, it's gr my great honor to be part, part of this workshop and following the talk of my uh, great advisor, Dr. Damon Santola. I graduated from University of Pennsylvania in 2016, and I have been studied uh, with Dr. Santola for the past uh, three years. So my talk today is uh, a bit of a more specific about social influence for behavior change. I will mention one specific study that uh, Damon just mentioned, the Penship study. So my research area broadly focuses on communication processes, persuasive message effects, and in the context of new, me new media technology. So um, just give uh, one example about how we can conceptualize the different mechanisms for the effects of media campaigns. So as you may know about the literature on campaign effects, when we talk about how media campaigns change people's behaviors, there are at least uh, three different mechanisms. One is the campaign message can directly change a person's behavior, or the campaign message can lead a person to talk with other people about the promo uh, promoted behavior in the campaign. And lastly, the campaign has an indirect effect, which the campaign message can prime a person to uh, pay attention to other people's behaviors. So basically, here's the case of a people's uh, behavior threshold has been lowered by other people's behaviors presented in their social networks. Um, so when we talk about evaluation of campaign um, uh, media campaigns, traditional methods just to use individual surveys with random sampling. So this kind of evaluation can get into individuals' attitudes, opinions, and behavior change, but it's never going to get us some insights about the social influence mechanisms especially referring back to the indirect mechanisms of the campaign effects. So um, I find computational methods useful in um 
One example is to do uh, uh, computer simulations using uh, agent-based modeling to actually model the process of uh, in social influences in a population. So in one case, I just assume that the media campaign messages can lower behavior threshold, so individuals would require uh, less behavior social signals to change their behaviors. So if uh, on a conceptual level, we can think about how messages of the campaign diffuse in a population and also how the behaviors diffuse differently than the message. So in one case, um, uh, talking to someone is relatively easier than changing behaviors. So the messages would diffuse in the population more like a simple contagion process. But the behaviors, more difficult behaviors for people to change are more like a complex contagion process. But when we think about these two process together, uh, one question is whether the campaign messages can uh, change people's behavior threshold, then systematically change the complex contagion process into something similar to a simple contagion. So that's a question that I'm interested in. So I did some explorations of the different effects of messages and see, so at what uh, persuasive the uh, persuasive levels of the messages can actually change the complex contagion process into a simple uh, contagion process, uh, making the uh, behavior diffusion much faster in uh, uh, random networks. So this is just an example of showing uh, the different messages that are ex explored in the space. Um, so with that, um, so my real interest is to actually to use online social network experiments to verify the different message strategies and to see whether different message strategies can uh, influence behaviors and now we can track behaviors diffusions in real networks over time. Uh, two questions that we can answer from doing online network experiments, one uh, relating to the question is, can social message actually lower people's behavior threshold? Then we can actually make more people to adopt some healthy behaviors. And the other one question, also very interesting, is to see whether artificially constructed online social networks actually influence people's offline behaviors. Whether online uh, clustering actually translate into offline behavior clustering in real world settings. So that's uh, where I started to do the experiments under the guidance uh, of Dr. David Santola. So this is one online program we designed for a fitness program. The goal is to encourage students to go into offline exercise classes. We designed the website and uh, we uh, put um, participants into online social networks and then uh, push the social messages to the individuals in order to push them to go into more exercise classes. So what we found from this study is that the artificially designed online networks were really more effective than directly sending persuasive messages to individuals to encourage them to go to more access classes. So this example just illustrates that the mess we can treat it as campaign messages can really lower individuals' behavior threshold to actually promote more healthy behaviors in the population. And um, after that, I looked into the offline clustering of behaviors. So this figure, the raw figure, just shows that the artificially constructed online social networks actually translated into offline behavior clustering. So people who are put into the same online networks were also more likely to attend to the same access classes offline. So this is the case of translating online manipulations into real world um, behaviors in the offline setting. Uh, so my next steps for the research is just to continue to look at the three different dynamics for campaign effects uh, in the population. So looking at the direct effect, mediated effect, and indirect effect simultaneously and to see how they actually interact and simultaneously work in changing population's behavior. Okay, thank you. do any agent-based modeling, so don't look for that during the five minutes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've learned about computational social science through my work on online censorship and propaganda in China. And the basic message is that China engages in massive efforts to censor and propagate opinions online. It's obviously designed to try to control what information is available to the public. But when we study it at scale, it actually reveals something about this opaque regime. 
um, where we can't rely on government statistics, where there's no press running around in the equivalent of the White House. Um, so we know actually more about this country precisely because the government is trying to control the information that we have access to. Um, this is uh, based on a series of papers on censorship and propaganda with my co-authors, um, Gary King and Molly Roberts. Um, so on censorship, we gathered millions of social media posts from over 1,400 social media sites in China. And the key here is that we gathered th this media, social media content before the government censored it. So we have a subset of posts that the government censored and a subset of posts that they didn't. Before we did this research, the prevailing view was just that China gets rid of everything that's bad for the regime. Criticism, discussions of protests, but what we find is that China only censors discussions of real world collective action. It allows there to be vitriolic criticisms of the government, policies, leaders. Um, so in this plot, this is a six month time period, just a sample of posts about people complaining um, that power prices are increasing. And this burst of discussion happens when the government increases power prices. And in the red are the posts that are censored. So you see a burst of discussion, but no corresponding burst in censorship. Um, so this is one instance where criticism is allowed to remain online. In another example, here, same time period, these are people talking about a city in southern China, Zhengcheng. There's a migrant protest in June. When that happens, people talk about it online. There's a burst of discussion. And everything related to that protest is uh, deleted, regardless of whether the posts are critical of the government or critical of the protesters for being chaotic and obstructing traffic. Um, so in this process, what we're doing is generating a theory from the data. Um, but to kind of be more sure of that, we conduct a randomized online experiment to get at the, uh, test the causal effects of um, collective action posts on censorship. We also look into the causal mechanisms and look at event analysis. And altogether, um, we find a very consistent message that online censorship is focused in China on removing discussions of protests and collective action while criticisms remain. And I think the other maybe half lesson is that when we generate theories in this way, um, validation is quite important. And through this variety of methods, we can learn more about opaque regimes um, than we were able to before. So moving from censorship to online propaganda, um, a relatively newer project, we gather data from China's so-called 50 cent army. So these are people posting social media content as if they were the opinions of ordinary people. So government astroturfing. We got data through an email leak where workers were reporting on the posts that they made online. So this is the ground truth. And that network plot is the workers reporting to this propaganda office. Um, using this data, we again found something different than the prevailing view of what China's 50 cent army does. We typically see um, 50 cent army as characterized as those who argue against those who are critical of China. So people who are super defensive of China, um, you could think of this as the anti-disestablishment. Um, but what we find is that the 50 cent army, they don't engage at all on anything controversial. Um, they instead are redirecting the public's attention away from central issues and collective action by cheerleading. And in this plot, um, the, we're dividing content into five categories. The important thing is that all of this stuff is in cheerleading, so motivational, inspirational content. And the different bars are different data sets moving from the leaked data to our a set of predicted, predicted uh, 50 cent accounts. And we also validate um, this uh, observational analysis with a survey where we compare, where we ask people if they're 50 cent party members, not quite like that. Um, and we compare the responses of those we know to be 50 cent and those who are we predict. And so you can summarize China's strategy really simply into two, two things. One, don't engage on controversial issues. Don't censor criticism. Don't argue against critics. And the second is stop collective action. Remove online discussions of collective action. Distract when collective action has happened. And I think the implication, at least for me in terms of computational social science, is that these efforts by governments or maybe corporations to control information leave big footprints. And when we study them at scale, we can learn a lot about things that these entities and actors are trying to hide. 
and maybe a second, as I mentioned, little lesson, is that um, as we're developing these um, theories from data, uh, we can actually use existing methods that we've used for a long time to validate and to um, build on what we have gotten out of the computational methods. Thanks. Good afternoon, almost lunchtime. I'm Mark LuBell. I'm in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy here at UC Davis. I'm a political scientist by training. I study cooperation problems in the context of environmental policy mostly. And as I was listening to the talks, I thought, you know, I could talk about what things like uh, what really is computational social science since we've been talking a lot about networks and big data. We could talk about um, things like computational social science as the new light post, right? It's a light, but don't forget about the other light posts that are already out there. And we could talk about complementarities, but I think those are good dis discussion items for the afternoon, so I'll go ahead and talk about some of the things I wanted to say. Um, where are we, in my view, and the sorts of work that I do? Um, well, I think one of the things where we are with computational social science is coming to a recognition, a recognition that social networks and, and other sorts of networks do matter but exactly the conditions under which they matter um, is, is one of the things that we still need to work on. So this example here is a, a picture of democracy. I mean um, a picture of sea level rise adaptation in San Francisco Bay, which is actually, if you look at all policy systems, is the mess that democracy produces. So this gives us a way to, to start looking at these problems, but this is only one place, right? This is one place at one, one point in time. So how do we understand the evolution dynamics of these sorts of networks? So when you look at computational approaches to networks, you have um, a lot of benefits that you could get out of them. We can do comparative analysis over space and time in a way we never have been able to do before if you look at things like Facebook and Twitter and that, and that type of thing. And networks are good at representing complex inter inter interdependent systems where you might have things like contagion or um, you know, small femto risks, so to speak, where you have a small perturbation that, that trickles throughout the system. But we don't really have very much good meta theory about uh, under what conditions do we expect different sorts of networks to function in different types of ways? What sorts of dynamics would we expect? What's, when, when do we expect networks to have multiple functions? Um, we have some theories about what the micro-level mechanisms driving network formation are, like uh, preferential attachment, but demonstrating what those are in different empirical settings is something we can do or start to think about, about when big data computational approaches. Um, and then connecting these networks to, at the system level, individual level, how all the different levels uh, from the individual to the network to the macro level all combine. Another thing that I think we've done in the context of um, networks is that we've shown that computational models are useful. And this diagram here is some work that I did with Paul Smaldino, who is sitting right here, who I would recommend working with if you can uh, corral him, because he's an awesome at computational uh, modeling. And here we took this idea that there's multiple games that people play, and they, they, they move around in the different networks, and they, they exit games that they're not getting what they want out of. And we tried to understand the evolution of cooperation here. And we rediscovered the old wine that if you get cooperators to positively assort with each other, in other words, that if they're more likely to meet cooperators than defectors, you're going to get the evolution of cooperation. And you can build different types of institutions in these games to try to make that happen. But it turns out that that's really the core principle that drives all models of cooperation. Any, anything that structures the population to get positive assortment can help you evolve cooperation. But so it was a fun exercise uh, that had applications to our particular area that we were looking at. So what are the benefits of these computational models? Well, we all know that they can help us incorporate complex processes, individual decisions in ways we may not have. Um, we can explore a lot of different scenarios, which people have talk, talked about before, but there's a lot of challenges. You have to try to empirically parameterize them, 
under, uh, requires understanding so-called emergence, which by, by the way, I, I don't think there's such things as emergent properties. I think there's uh, properties that people don't understand very well because their models are too complex. And, um, and also a pathway to, to deductive mathematics. So if we have computational models, can we start to go towards models like RAISA builds, which are more uh, built on uh, first principles and de deductive mathematics? If you're smart enough like RAISA, you can do that. Um, if you're somebody like me, you can give her good ideas to, to build better models. Um, and then in all of this, I think we should remember this, that um, in computational social science, that all social science is, and all sciences, is that you have this type of dialogue. Somebody's described it as a didactic interaction between theory and data, and that's how science works. And uh, uh, we shouldn't be afraid of looking for the patterns in the data and coming up with theory and trying to get this dialogue to happen. That's where we're going to get some progress. So thank you. So I'm uh, Jeff Shank, and I'm from the uh, Department of Psychology. I'm a biological psychologist and an animal behaviorist. I come at these problems probably at a level of organization below what most people do, because I'm particularly interested in social interactions and social behavior. And what I want to talk about today is how we can get um, theory from using agent-based models. So I, I have a particular perspective. I have a, an evolutionary perspective, so I like to include that in my models. And that experiments can be used to frame problems. So I'm going to talk about an example today, and that is sharing in humans. So one of the problems is how do you explain that? I mean, is it empathy, reputation, social punishment? Um, if we look at experiments that have been done, with sharing behavior, they can structure the problem where we can begin to develop some theory. So I'm going to start with the dictator game. This is a game that's been used by economists and anthropologists lots of times. It's a very simple game where you have two players. One is a dictator, one's a recipient. The dictator gets a resource. The dictator decides how to divide it. The solution to this game is very is obvious. The dictator should keep it all and give nothing. But that's not what's found in experiments around the world and across cultures. People give 30%, in fact, and a large number of people in these experiments divide it. Why do they do that? So one approach to doing this is to develop an experiment and use the payoffs from the game in an agent-based model to uh, select uh, on the behavior of sharing. So one of the things we can take away from these experiments is they're done under anonymity. There's no information usually that's available about uh, the people that are participating in these experiments. So we can start by modeling our agents as having no cognitive abilities whatsoever, except, except for um, being able to decide whether to share or not. The other part that comes from my background is I like to add a lot more detail about the biology, and I call it adding generic biological properties, such as um, reproductive constraints, parental investment, social be behavior that will generate population structure. And then what we do is literally set up evolutionary experiments where we can vary parameters, but we let these agent populations evolve. So we can have experimental conditions in which they interact with their neighbors because proximity is very important in cooperation and uh, control conditions where we just let any agents interact and play with each other. And so here is the results of a particular uh, experiment. So at the bottom 
is agent populations. We start them out very selfish, so they're red. And as the populations evolve, they turn purple and blue, which means they're starting to share. At the top, we have um, a graph over time, so that's many thousands of interactions, so the way we measure that. And the blue line is the average behavior of humans, which is give about 30%. So the population is evolving towards that. And I'll just go through these quickly. So a strength of agent-based model is discovering emergent behavior. But in this case, the data we see is emergent theoretical data. So can we then discover theory from these results? Why should this have ever evolved? And here's what happens in these simulations. By including generic biological properties, what we find in the first diagram is selfish agents, and the other is our uh, sharing agents. And what happens is that if there are constraints on how they convert resources into offspring, then sharing can result in more offspring being produced in these clusters. And my conclusion is uh, I hope to be able to or we develop more uh, theoretical approaches using this and tools to support this. Okay, thank you for uh, having me. Uh, my name is PJ Lamberson. I am now a professor in the Department of Communication at UCLA, but I'm a mathematician by training. And I subtitled this talk, What Have We Forgotten After a Decade? And what I want to focus on, uh, the, what I'm referring to is the importance of using causal theoretical models uh, to drive our empirical research. And it's clear from many of the talks today that uh, the we who has forgotten this are not, is not the we in this room um, or the we of the people who have been presenting because many people have hit on this point throughout today's talk, uh, to, today's uh, workshop. Um, but I'm going to make this point again anyway. Uh, so this is a chart that comes from, I, I got it from a book on conservation modeling and biology by a guy named Tony Starfield, but it came from an even older paper, the reference of which is cut off over there by uh, Holling from 1978 that tries to understand, uh, sort of breaks down our knowledge of a problem into two dimensions, uh, how much data we have and how much we understand the kind of theoretical mechanism underlying that problem. And so you can think of sort of box number two up here as the traditional domain of the physical sciences. This is, you know, Duncan Watts says, uh, rocket science isn't really hard. You know, we're actually really good at doing rocket science. Uh, rocket science is up in box Number two there, where we have good understanding of what's going on and we have plenty of data going on, we can make good predictions and really understand the phenomenon. Traditionally, social science has spent a lot of time down in boxes sort of three and sometimes making it over to four, uh, where we didn't have very much data and we didn't exactly know what was going on. And the way we tried to move from box three over into box four was by using causal theoretical models that helped us sort of explain the consequences of what we supposed or, or thought might be true. Right. More recently, however, I would say that a lot of social science, this idea of big data and computational social sciences has, has jumped us up into box number one, where we have lots and lots of data, but we still don't necessarily understand the problems that we're working on. And this is why I think it's so important for us to keep remembering how we used to work to move from box three to four was by using these causal theoretical models, and we need to still do that Maybe even before we jump into the pool of box number one, uh, we should think about using those models to sort of determine how we're going to collect that data, what data we're going to collect, and so forth. And so with the rest of my brief time, I want to give one of my favorite examples, which is not from my own research, but is an example from research by one of my mentors, uh, Carl Simon, who is a professor of economics, mathematics, and public policy at the University of Michigan, and was fundamental in early research on the spread of, of HIV. 
So uh, when HIV first emerged, we actually had some reasonable data on uh, this at the population level. This is San Francisco. This is Chicago. Uh, San Francisco, we had data going from the very beginning because there was a study about hepatitis in a population of gay, gay males in San Francisco going on at that time. If we had blood samples, we could go back and look at the prevalence of HIV all the way from when it very first showed up. And uh, at this time, epidemiologists were applying the kind of standard tool of epidemiology, which is this susceptible infected uh, recovered model in which you bin people into these three buckets, susceptible, infected, and recovered. And you have an infection rate at which people transition from susceptible infected, which is governed by this parameter beta, which basically measures um, if you have an infected person who has sex with an uninfected person, what's the probability that that uninfected person becomes infected, right? We can actually measure that parameter beta not by just curve fitting, but by looking at, at we had individual data at this point, um, we can actually know who had sex with whom and whether or not the infection was transmitted. So we could measure the actual beta and when you put that beta into the model and generate a curve, it turns out you get the wrong curve. It doesn't fit the data, okay? And so there was something wrong. And what, what Carl and his colleagues hypothesized was that there was something else going on, and they had some sort of reasons to think this might be true, that when a person first becomes infected, there's a short time period at which they are very infectious, all right? Because the viral load goes way up before the immune system has a chance to react. And then after that, you become less infectious for a long, long time until the very end um, when you become more infectious again. But we couldn't measure this because we didn't have anybody right after they got infected. We never knew right when someone became infected. But they went ahead and built a model anyway. They built a model where you had sort of these different stages of infections and different parameters beta. Um, and in particular, they're interested in this primary infection, how infectious you were when you, in the very early stages. And they generated a bunch of models and, and curves based on different values of these betas. And they estimated that you could get the kind of right aggregate curve if you had a very high primary level of infectivity, okay? And what subsequently happened, many, many decades later, this paper, the reference, I think you can't see it again, but this was from 1994. Um, they, they, but, you know, we didn't know this. We had no way of knowing it at this time. And many years later, uh, this has been validated. This guided the way that data was collected. So first of all, we were then later able to collect data of the actual viral load in people right after they became infected. And we saw that this, what they call the bathtub, uh, shaped curve does happen. Your viral load goes way up initially and then goes down, which is a causal mechanism to explain why you might be more infectious in the primary infection stage. And then even more convincingly, we were able to do uh, genetic analysis over time in a person's body as the virus is reproducing, it mutates. And so we can tell whether or not you were infected with the strain of, a, of the virus that a person had right when they were, right when they were infected or whether you, uh, the next person was infected with a strain that had mutated inside that person's body and were infected with it later. And then you can trace the prevalence of those different strains in the population and see that there's a much higher prevalence of those strains of the virus that occurred in an individual's body right after they were infected than later, right? And this is huge data. You have to do genotyping on the virus and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and that, that data collection exercise was guided by this theory that was, collect, you know, uh, mathematically modeled 20 years or 30 years uh, before. And so I just think that's a good um, representative example of how I believe this computational social science should be done by starting with these detailed causal theoretical models and moving to the data collection to help try to validate those theories or try to understand where they work and where they don't. Thanks. Hi, I'm Paul Smaldino. Uh, this is five minutes of reflections on computational social science. I'm gonna try to do this in five minutes, and so I wanna say exactly three things. Uh, these are the things, and I will then say them after this slide. Um, so, uh, last year this paper was published in PLOS Biology uh, called All Biology is Computational Biology. And I think this paper is awesome, uh, and I'm going to be lazy and just read it. Uh, the abstract is, I argue that computational thinking and techniques are central to the quest of understanding life, 
that today all biology is computational biology. Computational biology brings order to our understanding. It makes biological concepts rigorous and testable. It provides a reference map. It holds together individual insights. The next modern synthesis in biology will be driven by mathematical, statistical, and computational methods being absorbed into mainstream biological thinking, turning biolo biology into a quantitative science. The point here is that we don't talk about microscope biologists or regression biologists, right? It's a method. We talk about biologists and we divvy up biologists just by what they study, not how they study it. And I think the exact same point can be made about social science, right? All social science is computational social science because all social science benefits from computational uh, quantitative approaches. And so to call computational social science something separate from social science uh, is, I think, a temporary situation in which we now have a new method that we're all excited about, but eventually will be wrapped up into social science more generally. I think two uh, consequences come from that. One is that all social science is social science, right? So we don't, we're not here at a workshop on computational economics or computational sociology, computational psychology. We're here about a workshop on computational social science because we're all interested in studying social behavior and we just, those uh, disciplines are kind of historical and they've used different methods and have different kind of niche areas, but really we're all interested in social behavior and we should kind of treat each other and all these different fields as under the umbrella of social science, I think, more formally. I think another thing comes out of that, which is that people who study social behavior, if they should be all under the umbrella of a single uh, field, should think about the fact that social scientists are not so different from people who study social sciences in other contexts, like biology. There's a great uh, essay that was just published uh, by Daniel Nettle, who's a kind of every uh, wunderkind of behavioral science. I'm just gonna read this. Uh, I highly recommend you check this out on his website. Everything social scientists do is biology. It is not that it will be replaced by biology in the future in some who's afraid of Virginia Woolf nightmare scenario. Everything social scientists do already is and always has been biology. Why? Because biology is the study of living things. Humans are living things. So whatever they do, however they organize themselves, whatever extraordinary technologies they create, whatever meanings they entertain, reasons they give, or tastes they develop, these are biological processes. All right? And I think we do ourselves a disservice if we don't look into the way that other people who study social phenomena do things and what kind of insights they've learned, whether it's meerkats or termites or human beings. These are all social processes. and. There's a lot to generalize and learn from each other across approaches. Evolutionary biology and ecology have developed very rich theories over decades and centuries that we can't, uh, can't afford to not draw from. All right, that's point number one. The second is the louder stereo principle. All right, social science is still different when we study humans, right? Humans are different than other species because we have culture and technology. And uh, when we have computational methods now, that gives us what I'm gonna call a louder stereo. And this is from, I'm a big fan of the artist Jonathan Richman. Uh, I don't know if you know any of his music, but uh, he has a great song called Parties in the USA. And he says, of course, nowadays at parties, you have louder stereo equipment. So now, if the party's too loud, it's like a radioactive shipment. This is not an argument against partying. One of the lyrics is, we need more parties in the USA. <laughs> right? This is saying that because we have this technology, bad parties are really, really bad. Right? And so bad computational social science can be really, really bad. So this came out last year. I'm, I have a minute, so I'll just say I hate this so much with a fiery passion and I want it burned to the death. Um, don't do this. Don't try to use your methods to improve your H index or uh, your citability, right? This produces bad science. Last year, uh, my colleague Richard McElrath and I published a, a paper where we modeled science and showed that very clearly, incentives for publication leads to the degradation of methods and the increase of false discoveries in the literature. Um, so let's try to have integrity in all the science we do. All right, finally, um, theory is here to stay. I don't have to say too much about this because the people who came before um, did a really excellent job, but this came out in 2008 in Wired. It was a, head, a cover story. Uh, the end of theory, the data deluge made scientific theory obsolete. This is also really stupid. Um, uh, Michael Macy published an essay a couple years ago uh, in which he has this nice line, the era of big data is not the end of theory, but it is the beginning. All right? We now have what much more data to test more intricate, more uh, involved theories. And we can use the data, I think, in exactly the way PJ talked about, um, in an interaction with theory. 
what we're trying to do fundamentally as scientists is un explain the world, or at least that's what I want to do, right? Is come up with real explanations of what's happening, not just gather facts about what's happening, but explain why those facts are, and that is theory. All right, so, and if we're not doing that, right, we're just coming up with a bunch of things to check off a list, and I'm gonna leave you with this last quote from Gerd Gigerenzer, data without theory are like a baby without a parent, their life expectancy is low. Thank you. My name is Seth Fry. Um, I'll be starting as a professor of communication here at UC Davis. Woot, I'm very excited. Um, my training is uh, cognitive science. I'm interested in the um, individual reasoning foundations of larger scale social outcomes. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a young scholar. I don't even know if I have 10 years under my belt, but I do have a, a vision. Um, and I think one thing we've learned in the past couple of years is that it is possible to study populations of populations, that we can do uh, do lar perform large-scale studies, whether comparative or, uh, or experimental, um, of whole social systems, usually engineered. Uh, to map that out, rather than looking uh, merely 100 years in the future of social science, I'm going to look 1,000 years in the future of social science. So uh, that's, uh, that's the Earth. In, a, in the next 1,000 years, everything will have gone to pot. Uh, but our uh, benevolent alien overlords will have come from across the galaxy and make everybody happy, okay? They're going to try this. Uh, it's not going to go too well because um, people kind of want, we all want a different world. Our perfect world is different for every single one of us. So they really want to make us happy. They're going to create all possible Earths. Um, so let's see. This is why I want the laser. That one right there and that one right there, it's actually just like this one except uh, David Hasselhoff was born Darvid Hasselhoff. There's a typo in his birth certificate. And world history from the 80s on just unfolded completely differently. Uh, so in another one of these, there's a sort of uh, all possible anarchist utopias. And there's a, a bunch of things that have fallen apart. Um, OK, so what they did is they gave every single one of us an advice. You exist in all of these in parallel, but uh, you have a device that allows you to sort of transfer your experience of consciousness to whichever world you like. So uh, you, you move through this space kind of sequentially uh, through this space of all possible worlds to your favorite one. Okay? Bear with me. So this, this is a thing. Uh, so actually, if you think about this, um, all in this world, all social sciences have become experimental sciences. And social sciences have become easy. The, the fundamental questions, uh, man's inhumanity to man is an empirical question. You just look at all the ones that do, all the ones that don't, you're good. Uh, a, a history is an experimental discipline. Um, but, that's not, but, but there's still problems. There's still problems for our alien overlords. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. I'm going to skip. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, there, there, there's actually an engineering problem, the infrastructure of the matrix. Uh, there's a load balancing problem. We're not evenly distributed through all the worlds. We actually kind of cluster in a couple of them. And our alien overlords want to predict where we're going to end up. Uh, so that they can invest more resources in the Earth so they're better represented and not waste all this energy supporting all possible Earths all the time. Uh, okay, now that's a kind of a fanciful question, but uh, you know, can we, uh, they ask, uh, can we predict uh, uh, Earthling uh, popular Earths given individual Earthling preferences? Uh, but this corresponds actually to an interesting question in our reality. Uh, which basically you won't know, weigh do people's preferences for you know uh, this versus that type of social system. These are the, these are those values um, uh, result in large scale institutional changes. Uh, so now hopping forward, yeah, yeah. So these seemingly fanciful questions are valuable and answerable now. Uh, so this. Uh, do we have this now? Well, I mean, there's Facebook, and you know, it's like n of a billion. That's great. But in another sense, it's sort of n of one in the sense of populations of populations. Twitter, is it? Well, yeah, it's sort of a couple hundred million, but also N of one. Uh, but there are other systems. So a lot of online communities do have this. Uh, Reddit and Twitch, um, all the, all the spin-offs of Wikipedia, uh, do give us independent instantiations of uh, populations that are comparable. Uh, and so, and, rather, and the process by which any one of those changes in time can be seen as a trajectory through this abstract space. Okay, um, I'm studying, uh, oh, what? 
Well, that's, um, so even theme parks in Meat Space, my uh, graphic didn't show up. A theme park is a large-scale engineered social system that gets amnesia once a week. There's a big red reset button. Changes to it are engineered, controlled, and known. And, uh, and so, again, we can understand the changes in, in any physical engineered social system as a directory through this abstract space. Uh, even when you make choices in your life, you're cho choosing for a world that does the same thing but, re but represents different values in doing it. Whether you tip 15 or 20, whether you use Airbnb or couch surfing, they do the same thing, but your choice between them reflects how you want them to do it. And though, again, these uh, can be understood as a directory through this abstract space. Uh, these questions go way back. In my own work, this is the space of all two by two games, or uh, a version of that space. And so this gives us uh, trajectories through these can give us institutional evolutionary processes. In current work, I pick one of those games randomly, make you play it. Pick one right next to it, make you play it, and ask you which one you want to play again. Repeat that thousands of times so we can get trajectories through this space. Uh, in uh, Minecraft, uh, you can get the observational, more ecologically valid version of that because servers are run by random people. They're all amateur utopian theorists trying to make a world that works. And they have to compete uh, for players. And again, that choice of a player taking between that server and that server, doing the same thing in different ways, allows us to represent this space today. Um, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, Paul, I'm really intrigued with your notion of what I would consider a dualistic approaches to the sciences, the vitalistic approach from the biological sciences and, the, for lack of a better label, the mechanistic notions from the physical sciences. Um, and physical mathematical science. Could you talk more about that? Sure. Uh, so I, I, what I meant to say and then kind of lost uh, the thread a little bit um, was to build on some stuff that had been said earlier or I, that, you know, obviously I think we should in, in, increase mathematical and computational training in the social sciences and in the biological sciences, I think, you know, we're doing science here, we have to use quantitative methods. Um, I, I guess I, you know, I, I worry sometimes that I, my, you know, my vision is maybe too sort of conciliance-based, you know, all the, the unification of all knowledge pie in the sky, but, you know, I think that we should all, you, you know, use methods, and computational and mathematical methods are going to, you know, need to be sort of diffused throughout all the sciences. Um, so it's, I don't, I'm not really a dualist there. I, I think that everyone should get training in all these things. And uh, there should also be disciplines that study those things for themselves, because that's important too. Um, but I think that there is something that is kind of fundamentally different about the study of agents versus the study of materials. And uh, so I guess, you know, I, if that's dualistic, then I'm dualistic. Hi. So just uh, more a comment than a question, but um, I'm an epidemiologist or trying to become to become one. Uh, so I'm really happy the fact that you mentioned this causal causal pathway. And I don't know if you want to extend spend a little bit more of time talking about it. I will be really happy. I don't know about the rest. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. <laughs> Well, one of the nice things I think about this particular story that I was telling that I didn't have much time to talk about was that this wasn't the only suggested causal mechanism for the uh, over prevalence essentially of HIV relative to what we expected given our empirical measurements of this infectivity. Um, there, and you know, this is not my research, this is Dr. Simon's research and, and others, um, but there were heated arguments in the journals and sort of, you know, to the point of name calling practically where people were saying, no, this, this, this primary infection model is wrong and, and instead it should be this. Um, but the nice thing was that both, all of these people were building these, these causal models and, and then in the end, you know, we could then say, well, what data did you need to collect in order to validate one model versus the other to test between these two. And uh, over many years, as our uh, tools and methods for collecting that data improved, for example, this ability to genotype the, the viruses uh, on a large scale uh, and over, you know, uh, at many time points, that allowed them to show that in, indeed there is good evidence for this particular mechanism. And, and I think we can do the same thing in other versions of social sciences. One of my other favorite examples that I won't, didn't talk about because Damon can talk about it himself is, is uh, but I think, I really think that, that Damon's done a great job of doing this in, in his research. You know, um, he wrote a paper on complex contagions and what we expect between the difference between, uh, you know, a complex contagion or a simple contagion with respect to the effect of randomization of a network and where we expect it to things to spread more easily or less easily. And that was a nice, clean, theoretical result that made a clear prediction. And so then what did he do? Uh, well, he went and said, well, what data would you need to collect in order to test that model? And he did it and, and, and found something and said, well, this is an argument that in this certain case, we see complex contagion. And so both of those I think are great sort of, you know, examples or exemplars for how I think good social science should be done, good computational social science where we can develop a, a theory and then go and test it with our new tools rather than say, we've got a whole bunch of Twitter data, what are we, what's going on? Um, Uh, if I can build on the point um, that Peter's talking about, uh, about Simon's model, what's so interesting about it is that the model is radically underdetermined by the data, right? There are lots of possible models that could fit those data. And we tend to get kind of fixated on a calibration exercise. I mean, what's so interesting about that project is that by picking out a mechanism and saying this is the mechanism, that allows for other routes for explanation. Say, well, if you can just find that mechanism other places, not necessarily in those data that have that complete shape, that gives a different route to evidence and allows you to kind of buttress an argument from multiple sides. Um, and that becomes, I think, a very powerful way of thinking about science. Um, I will say that I, I do, I believe wholeheartedly in identifying mechanisms. Um, I don't think that all mechanisms need to be computational or even mathematical. I mean, I think that when we identify a mechanism, it just, it has a kind of counterfactual idea behind it, which is that if we changed some feature of the system, we would get a different result out of it. 
right? I think that's the, the, the key intuition and finding different ways of extracting that from different sources of data is very, very powerful. So um, most of the panelists here mentioned that that's great complementarity between um, um, agent-based models and uh, generating theoretical data and also empirical tests of uh, theoretical models. So uh, just sort of to piggyback on uh, Jennifer Pan's question during the last panel, you know, what is there um, a paradigm, is, is there this ideal or perfect way of knowledge discovery, of doing science that combines these two approaches? And if there is, what does it look like? And now we have these computational tools um, as well as a vast amount of empirical data. So there is no excuse not to do both. So should people even attempt to do both? So I asked the question because I was curious of perspectives. But I think what this various presentations, this panel and previous show, is that I'm not actually sure there is one mode of approaching but there are probably some principles um, that one study is probably not enough, that as Paul said, you have to have theory or some substantive knowledge, even though we need to improve um, our training and statistics or computation and math. Because without some sort of theory or substantive knowledge, then we couldn't even start to make sense of way too much data. Um, but exactly where that comes in or what we mean by theory is, probably varying. Um, so I think maybe there's some themes around that and also I think around reproducibility and being able to then build on this research um, rather than being the case that, oh, you have all this Twitter data, um, you do your research, but then no one else has this exact data set or knows exactly what you did with it to be able to build on it. Uh, I want to add something to the question. So. I missed the second panel, but I felt like an, my central approach is to doing um, experiments for intervention purpose. So how to make different designs of the system to change people's behaviors. So when for the for the tradition of um, thinking about interventions, there's another piece of research that we always do is to do observational studies to understand the phenomenon in the first place. And so traditionally, we did like formative research and interviews with individuals to understand how they live their life. And and also, in addition to that, using computational methods, I think all this social media also uh, provides some um, uh, spaces for us to do like kind of similar qualitative research to understand what people are thinking and also doing in their everyday life. So I think a su successful model would be that uh, combining all these different methods to derive some of the theoretical hypotheses from all those observations, whether from individual like real human beings or from all their expressions on the social media sites, and then derive some theoretical hypotheses and then test them in experiments and uh, then moving to field experiments to see whether these different kind of designs are thinking of the design designs could actually make a real world impact. I want to elaborate on that. So Jingwen did a couple of different projects with these exercise sites. And the first one was kind of a pilot, collected some data, and then asked people what they would have liked, right? What kinds of uh, interfaces or social experiences they would have preferred. Um, and then when we ran a second one, we put that uh, sort of into one of the social worlds, and then did another one which was a little bit more theoretically motivated in terms of what we thought would work. And what was so interesting was the world where um, we gave people exactly what they asked for. Participation actually was lower than in the control condition where they got nothing, right? So there was like this backfire effect, which was surprising, um, and a direct result of kind of using self-report as a way of explaining behavior. Um, and so there's, there's real value to collecting those data, but also it, it informs everything that we think about in terms of how to interpret data that come from not just observation, but also interviews. The one thing, which is what she said down there. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your name right off the top of my. It's probably on my list, but <laughs> excuse me for not getting it right right now. But what you just said, I think you could have said in a um, conference on qualitative data analysis, right? It's a process of science, and the principles that you're looking for are the same principles that have been around for a long time about how to do science well, how to 
link deductive and inductive reasoning, how to think about theory building and testing and transparency and replicability. And computers and computational approaches are a medium for conducting that scientific enterprise. I don't think that they are a necessarily unique scientific enterprise unto themselves, but it's a medium for doing all that stuff. And maybe we can do some of it better and, and, and look at other phenomena that we were unable to observe before, but that doesn't mean like all of a sudden we've got some new principles of science that, um, that, that we no longer have to adhere to. I actually want to make one one point on on jumping on this whole bandwagon, and especially on something as part of your question, and then especially something that, that Damon said. Um, you know, this integrating sort of models and experiments is is really just sort of different ways to approach hypothesis generation and hypothesis testing, right? And and I don't think there's a there's there should be a strict uh, differentiation between agent-based models and mathematical models or verbal models as long as they're well specified. I mean to some extent what we're doing when we are even even before we do an experiment, right, or we come up with a theory or a hypothesis, we're breaking down a system into the parts and the relationships between those parts that we think are valuable for an explanation. And a model is just one way of sort of looking at what those parts are and what kinds of things would naturally flow as a consequence of the assumptions we're making about the parts. And you can do that in any number of ways. So I have a question that uh, is focusing a little more on the um, what an outsider would say about computational models. So I'm, I consider myself a computational model native, and, and I'm a great fan of it. But sometimes I, I think we may be preaching to the choir, and there are lots of people out there in the social sciences who are very skeptical about computational models and agent-based models. And one of the areas that comes up again and again from that, from, from that uh, constituency is um, how on earth are you getting your parameter estimates? And you know, the response is, oh, I get them because I've, I've done a lit review, I've looked at meta-analysis, I've looked at the effects. And uh, I think, um, I think it was Jeff, I think uh, you had a slide where you said that one of the challenges, I think it was on your slide, the challenges is getting the, uh, is estimating those parameters using what kind of parameters to use in these computational models. Um, I'd love to get your take on what are the better practices today in terms of being able to get those parameters so that you can build more credibility to the to the model in response to people saying it's garbage in, garbage out. You put whatever parameters you want, you can get any results you want, but that doesn't help us much. Well, one of the things that I do is focus on experiments. So I, I emphasized using the experiments to frame the problem. So then that constrains some of the parameters that you need because you just take them from the results of experiments. Um, the other thing that you can do it, and that sometimes people don't do as, as much as systematically explore the model. So put yourself in the point of view of a, uh, an experimentalist who is unconstrained as, on how many experiments they can run and investigate how sensitive the model is to uh, parameters that you're uncertain about. Well, I agree with that. I mean, this idea of sweeping over parameters and so forth. And I mean, as someone who is, does a lot of computational social science, I also don't see it as you know, weird or different. And I think it's very similar to, you know, I've tried to, I have published in economics and economists are particularly prone to this criticism that, uh, well, this is a computational model. It doesn't count for anything. Where's the proof? Um, and, but in, my perspective, it's there's no difference. We're all making assumptions. We're all, um, you know, making assumptions in our models, and and sweeping over parameters is a great way of, of testing that. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I think that I mean, obviously, you think a lot about this question too. So we, you know, you can respond to your own question, um, but the, <laughs> um, but I think it's implied by your facial reactions here. Um, but so, look, when we, when we do this kind of parameter sweeping, um, we obviously don't know what the boundary conditions are. And so part of what we're doing is discovering the boundary conditions. But I think that 
when we think about that in relation to the um, empirical data that we collect, you know, running an experiment is, as you know, I think everyone at the table knows, it's, it's, it's really complicated, right? There's a lot of decisions to make. In fact, way more decisions than you would like to make. Um, from, you know, everything from the way that to structure relations to like the color of the web page. I mean, you know, and like what matters? And the, you know, the, you know, the matter of the fact is we, we quite frankly don't know a lot about what matters. Um, and so the, the parameter space, of course, it's as multidimensional as we can make it, gives us a sense of where we are, right? And I think that's really important because when we start to work empirically, whether it's observational or experimental, the data we're collecting is in this like really high dimensional space. And so if we can say, look, we're pretty sure that we're on safe ground here. Um, and so if we don't get what we expect to get, then our theory is really challenged because we kind of think we're like in the center of the target. Um, and then as we move, uh, you know, with our data collection to more peripheral areas, then we can say, well, this is where we'd expect the model to break down or, you know, what have you. Um, but I think that that relationship between, you know, parameter testing as a way of kind of establishing spaces of empirical robustness and the data collection as a way of kind of you know, understanding that space. And then, of course, you know, ideally in terms of the, you know, uh, synergistic relationship, then saying, well, there was a parameter that we hadn't even incorporated into our model, but things are going kind of haywire, right? There's a three-body problem we hadn't anticipated. Now it's showing up. We're getting little wobbles. Um, and that becomes way, a way of sort of intuiting that the model needs to be more sophisticated. But I do think that, you know, at the end of the day, um, we're at C, right? There's no, there's no dock to go in to repair planks. And so we're repairing planks while we're at sea, and we have to do that. We have to be strategic about moving and placing. So the boat, 100 years from now, will be a different boat. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, this is what I want to say. I might have a little bit to add on that. I definitely have a favorite example of simulations informing policy, uh, and that's uh, Vespignani's work. This insanely complex model of epidemics spreading throughout the world. Um, that you can test policy on, just like you can test policy on all kinds of Asian-based modeling. But what I think he's done differently is approaching a decade, tracked every single flu, made projections, talked to pol shown them to policymakers. Three months later, they find out he was right. Repeat next year, repeat next year, repeat next year. Build that trust that, yes, this model captures what actually happened, and only then can we start to trust it uh, for testing kind of factuals, for, for using it as a lab to test policy. Um, physics is one of the few disciplines where simulations are, are, are generally allowed to be in the realm of answering hypotheses rather than posing hypotheses. Um, and that's because there's common agreement, there's consensus about what should and shouldn't be in the model. I think it'll be a long time before social science is there, but uh, once you have that simulation can move into the side of being the question to being the answer. As the last question, I'm saying. <laughs> Going over time. Um, what I love about this panel is that, and I think that's all the, the existence of this panel is already one of the first lessons learned uh, with regard to the first decade, or the last decade of computational social science. Because, for example, in the 2009 paper, it's exclusively about big data, and we heard today several times that we often equate that with it. And maybe in 2008, the, the, the word big data didn't exist yet as as a catchphrase as big, so, but, but now we see that actually, yes, in science there's not only empirical, there's uh, also theoretical, and then experiments, which actually bridge between what is theoretically doesn't really exist in reality and, and what we could actually detect in reality, kind of like the bridge. And I think that's, the, I love that about this panel, there's one of the, the actually in the, in the computation social science, we move towards that as well. Now, listening to all of that and, and listening to what, I, what I've heard in the morning, uh, I think it's a lot uh, that we have to do then, or what our students will have to learn then, because then they have to become theorists, they have to become empiricists. And this morning we heard, for example, about the discussion with big data, with Josh, we said, like, of course, our students, they have to know computer science and social science. So well, at one point, something has to give. And now we have theorists here as well, and their theoretical models that, that are developed. Uh, computer simulations are something different. It's a different. It's a different art than doing big data analysis, empirical analysis. But now we suddenly have to do everything. That, and my question is, so in, in more in older sciences, in more mature science, you might say, for example, in physics, there's theoretical physicists and there are experimental physicists. And of course, Leonard Hofstadter and, and Sheldon Cooper don't respect each other 
uh, content-wise, and, and they hate each other, and there's this, but there's this completely disconnect. I mean, a, a, an experimental physicist will not come up with a theory. It just, it, it, a theoretical, an experimental physicist will just read the literature and pick one and, and then test that. Same as a theoretical physicist is not really interested in if it's ever been, you know, it's the, they're living in their old world. So is the social sciences, the more we go to this world, are we, so where, where should we focus? Should we focus on having people or training people who are computer scientists, social scientists, theorists, simulator, data, and like everything together? Or are we migrating more towards, you know, where maybe older sciences have been migrating to? I'm happy to caricature the uh, extreme view that, uh, yeah, life is short, science is wonderful, it's getting easier to learn everything. <laughs> so yeah, you have to learn everything. And <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll put myself there. But there is actually a guy whose name is Claudio, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Claudio Chioff, um, Chioffi Revilla, who is a George Mason, who actually wrote an article called Computational Social Science. And it was only about the Asian based model. And he published it two years before our piece. And I've met Claudio in a couple of, he heads up the Computational Social Science um, PhD program at George Mason University. And I often feel bad for him that he wrote an article with that same title and now everyone keeps referring to this piece that came out in science, which didn't even mention the Asian-based model, and that was entirely the focus, or maybe that was the problem, that, because that was the entire focus of his... Hey, David Lazar knows now, and he's kind of feeling sorry about it. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we all get together and lament that, yeah. <laughs> that there was a piece on Asian-based model called Computational Social Science that he published. Probably as was in Jordan. And, and just a comment to you, because, you know, in physics, the interplay between theory and experiment is the fundamental thing. So you wouldn't do theory unless there is some experiment that you're trying to test. And you can't do experiments without that interplay. It's like hand and glove. It's a tradition. So this all area of string theory, everyone's up for debate about it because there's no testable predictions. So it's looking more and more like mathematics and starting to leave physics departments. So I think we're in this beautiful time now that we can see this interplay between agent-based models, our real experiments, our social studies, and also the digital fingerprints that people are leaving. I imagine that someone spamming their H index has a very different kind of signature and citation patterns than a legitimate scientist with a high H index. So I thought that those were really interesting interplays to see people talking about these agent-based models and the experiments and thinking about how we're going to tease out the differences between those things. And I think that's why physics is such a rich field because that interplay between experiment and theory is the fundamental thing that makes it physics. Mm -hmm. uh, last comment. Uh, okay. I just thank you, Rosa. Uh, that was that's like 90% of what I wanted to say, but better put. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think that it speaks right to something that in physics, it is, yes, you have experimentalists and you have theorists, and the theorists build the theory and the experimentalists test the theory, and they develop complementary but different skill sets. And in social science departments, there's been an underemphasis on theory. And because now we have, mo not only do we have better modeling techniques, but we also have better data availability to test those models, I think that actually speaks to uh, a push toward more theory in social science department. The need for more theory now that there's more data to test with theory. Also as a theorist, you know, I want a job. <laughs> Can I say one more thing? Um, one thing that hasn't come up is just the consumption value of being an academic, which is that we have so much freedom to do what we want. And I think in terms of methods and specifically what you choose to really go deep in, part of it's probably what you enjoy. So maybe in graduate training you need exposure to all of these different methods, but at the end of the day you might really love one thing more than others, and that's what you become a specialist in, and you interface with others who do different things. So, thank you. <laughs>